Hello everyone, welcome to Lighthouse Worldwide Solutions September webinar. Uh, this month we'll be talking about how to validate your clean room, HVAC performance qualification basics. Before we start, I would like to introduce you our GoToWebinar platform. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type, it, type them in so that we'll be able to answer these questions. If there are too many questions during the event, uh, don't worry, we will get back to you and answer all these questions via email because we have all these records and uh, all questions will be answered for sure. My name is Arshim Solmas and I'm responsible for EMEA operations here in Lighthouse Worldwide Solutions. I have different responsibilities and in domestic and international organizations. One of them is IEST Contamination Control Institute. The reason I am emphasizing it because I'm also giving the uh, test methods, ISO 14644-3 test methods uh, trainings in IEST as well. Today we are going to see uh, partially the same uh, structure in order to define clean room testing. So first of all, we will start with a validation and definition as a um, as a uh, validation itself, and then we will take a look at it. What does it mean in clean room industry? Then we will be conducting on the standards and regulations that they are related to these uh, clean room validation. And uh, there will be some basics that I'm going to show you today. Then we will be conducting in testing order as well as application example from scratch. And then we will be reviewing our data and uh, preparing a report based on this information. So there will be Q&A session end of this event. I'm planning to make it in one hour sharp. Uh, I'll be sparing like uh, 10, 15 minutes at the end of the event, if possible, to answer questions. But like I said, if you're not able to answer all these questions, don't worry, we will get back to you. The first thing is about validation. So definition is a sentence that the act of proving that something is true or correct, according to Oxford Dictionary. But in our industry, in clean room, for example, ISPE, International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering, defining it as an achieving and maintaining compliance with applicable standards and regulations and fitness for intended use. That's the shortest and the lean definition of uh, validation. But when we say validation, let me show you with the laser pointer here. When we are talking about the validation definition, we have to emphasize this we scheme. Reason here, we have the validation planning side on the left, starting with user requirement specification, functional specifications, both hardware and software, and configuration specification as well. These are all specified the requirement before we build the entire system. This could be a computerized uh, software platform or the firmware for the device that we are going to use. Then after, we'll be testing on the right side, which is a validation reporting side. We will be starting with installation qualification, which is a configuration testing. You are going to test on the left side of this scheme and functional testing, which is operational qualification, also verifies that the functional specifications are met and uh, suitable for their intended use. So this verification side on the right side of this scheme is verifying the left side of the entire structure. When we move into the clean room validation, in general, we're talking about the requirement testing, which is performance qualification. So clean and performance qualification, also known as clean room HVAC validation, is just a PQ phase and the entire, while we're describing the entire area as the validation, we're just focusing on the top side, which is the final step for the clean room validation, especially for HVAC systems. So we are verifying that the user requirements are met based on their specifications in their URS. So the URS is the first step which describes all the uh, necessary uh, information and the, the expectation from the system. So what we're doing with the clean and performance qualification, known as clean and validation, 
is to verify all these information and do the testing and confirm that they are all suitable for the customer requirement. After defining the validation sentence in general, as well as the performance qualification, now we can call cleaning validation as a performance qualification for HVAC systems. Now, the standards and regulations. First of all, for cleaning classification, ISO 14644-1 is the only and the one standard for cleaning classification. There is no other standard for the regulation that are talking about the cleaning classification other than referring to ISO 14644-1 or just copying the information that we are providing through this part one. For example, GMP also talks about cleaning classification but directly related to the ISO 14644-1. Also, there are other standards that are talking about the cleaning monitoring or cleaning test, but none of them are talking about cleaning classification. Even microbiological sampling plan is the monitoring structure, not the clean room classification according to viable sampling. This is clean room monitoring according to viable sampling. So this test requires a particle counter. There is only requirement that you can provide a cleaning classification is to have a good particle counter in hand. This is a routine clean room particle count for classification, and this is always a risk-based approach. And typically on an annual basis, but you have to verify that the annual basis for clean classification is enough for you. For example, if it's a sterile manufacture, manufacturing, if you are rely on GMP requirements, then you need to add every six months for grade N and grade B environments. So not only standards, but also regulations that are related to your industry defines the requirements as well. Certain number of sample location has to be defined and certain number volume of air to be sampled at each location equally, which means every single clean zone that you define in your cleaning room has to be sampled with the same amount of air. And if all location samples average passes, clean room passes. If you fail in any of these locations uh, inside your clean room, then your report will fail. Now let's move on to the clean room testing. Uh, the standard that we are focusing on is ISO 14644 Part 3, Clean Room Test Methods. These Clean Room Test Methods defines principles in Part 4, procedures in Annex B, and apparatus in Annex C. This is what we call as a Clean Room Supporting Test. We will see later on with the table. However, I would like to emphasize it used to be, in 2005 version, used to be an optional test. Now the name changed as a supporting test. The reason we came with this change is because when we say an optional, people thought that this is just an optional test, we don't need them, or we can be surviving without having these tests uh, meet the criteria of these tests and make a pass and fail criteria for them. Now it's supporting but still different industries requires different tests with the different priorities. For example, electrostatic discharge for semiconductor industry is the top priority for the tests, while it's not critical for sterile manufacturing in pharmaceutical environment. Or in pharma, we have specific tests, which is temperature and humidity for the environment, but for the black cleaners where the operators are not doing anything but the machinery uh, meets all the criteria. Temperature and humidity is not as critical as we expected for the pharmaceutical environment. So each industry comes with a specific requirement where you can meet all these criteria. Let's move on to the next one. Since we have the standards on hand, there are also regulations where we are uh, referring to because we're not expecting all the standards to meet all the expectations for all industries. That's why we have uh, regulations from the regulatory bodies, like in GMP or IEST comes with recommended practices. ASHRAE comes with another one, NEBB here comes with uh, the procedural standards for certified testing of clean rooms, or CETA, Clean Room Environment Testing Association, or ISPE guidelines. They're all serving to you as a practical approach. 
because the standard is just giving you the definition, the apparatus that you are going to use and the methods that you will be following. But for application, the practice on site is also defined with these regulations or the supporting documents, the practices that we are using. Keep in mind, for example, IEST recommended practices 34, HEPA and UPA filter leak testing is also the base for the ISO 14644-3 HEPA filter testing. If you take a look at the new version, 2019 version, you'll be seeing in the bi bibliography saying that the uh, cleanroom standard, cleanroom regulation uh, prepared by the IEST as a recommended practices was the reference point to prepare this part of the ISO standard. That's why the all important sections cannot be found in the uh, document itself in ISO 14644 series, but you have to take a look at these practices and the documents that are prepared by the uh, subject matter experts from different uh, regulate, regulatory bodies. So, clean and performance qualification basics. We will be covering the clean and testing and uh, also classification here. If we start with cleanroom classification, we will be in need of two tables. One of them, table one, it gives us a maximum allowable concentrations, particle per meter cube, for particles equal to and larger than the considered sizes. This list gives us ISO class one to nine with 0.1 micron up to five micron limits. This is the latest one in 2015. As you can see, ISO class 5, 5 micron is not listed in this ISO table anymore. And keep in mind, previously 99 version, this was this table was an informative part, which means you will be making all your calculations to find the limit. Now it's moved into the normative part, the body section of the standard itself. And table A1, sampling locations related to clean room area. We used to have these calculations, now we have this table. Table 1 and table A1 is the most important part of our documentation in ISO for clean room classification. And the minimum sample volume, this is the one and the only calculation that we are going to do in ISO. A previously 99 version, there were a lot of statistical calculations, upper confidence limit calculations, and several mathematic equations included into the standard. Now there is only one, which is VS. So VS is expecting us to provide a minimum sample location. But keep in mind, it has to be minimum two liters or minimum one minute sampling in each location. So you can forget about minimum two liters because Commercially available particle compounds with the lowest flow rate nowadays is 0.1 CFM, which means 2.8 liters per minute. So if you take a look at these uh, 2.8 liters, the minimum sample 2 liters is already met. So one minute has to be your target. If your calculation for the VS gives you less than 2 liters, use your device or less than one minute, use your device minimum one minute sampling and each single sample volume at each sampling location shall be the same so what you can do you already have your particle counter with the non flow rate you can prepare your vs table minimum sample volume table based on your particle counter here this table shows you minimum single sample volume for each location how many liters you should take the next table shows you, if you have one CFM particle counter in each location, how many minutes you should spend to collect a reasonable amount of samples. Keep in mind, for example, you have ISO class 4 clean room and you are sampling one micrometer and larger particles in that location. If your particle counter says eight and a half minutes, minimum sample volume is one minute, you cannot take one minute sample and multiply it by 8.5 because normative calculation here has to provide a minimum sample volume. So you cannot just uh, get a minimum sample volume, less than a minimum sample volume and multiply it with a function. That's why this table, you have to follow the minimum requirements. 
Let's move on to the 100 liter per minute particle counter. Assume you have 100 liter per minute instrument. In this case, minimum uh, minutes that you are going to spend in each location is given in this table. I recommend you to have a similar uh, table for your targeted classes. For example, if your facility has ISO class 5, 6, 7, and 8 with one CFM, um, 100 liter per minute instrument, as you can see here, minimum one minute of sampling has to be collected in each location. Again, keep in mind, this is for ISO only. If you are a GMP regulated environment, GMP still says one cubic meter air has to be sampled in grade A environment. So in this case, you have to sample one cubic meter of air. If you have 100 liter per minute instruments, every location you should spend 10 minutes. I'm just giving you an example for ISO class, uh, and we prepare these tables for ISO 14644-1 requirements. As a subject matter expert, I can tell you, if you are going to move, assume GMP revise and follow the same path with ISO, I recommend you still take the highest possible flow rate from each location. Don't move from 10 minutes directly to the one minute sample because ISO says so, and GMP follows. Reason I'm saying, this might create a huge gap, which may create a huge risk for your facility. That's why maybe you can lower the minimum sample volume to eight minutes, let's say 800 liters, then 600, then 400, so you will be able to see what is the difference and the homogeneity of your particles during that period of time. Because the idea is, when you collect one minute sample with 100 liter per minute instrument, you will be multiplying it for, with 10, you'll be seeing in this example, to find out what is the exact amount of particles in meter cube. So in order to calculate it right, you have to start with one cubic meter for your device according to GMP, if ISO says and GMP follows with the next revision, I still recommend you to stick on this one cubic meter of air for a certain period of time and lower this volume step by step, not move from one cubic meter of air all the way to 28.3 liters per minute. That's a huge gap and a huge risk. And the clearance testing according to ISO 14644-3. Rest of all the tests, other than particle counts in cleanroom, known as a supporting test, according to 2015 version. We said that 2005 version, which is obsolete, it was an uh, optional test. Now the sentence changed as a supporting test, so they are all giving in the list. We have air pressure difference test, airflow, air direction, and visualization, recovery, temperature and humidity, HEPA filter testing containment leak test, electrostatic and ion generator test, particle deposition test, and segregation tests. These are all known as the requirement for the supporting test. You have to define which one is important for your facility, and you have to visit section four for principle, and the Annex B for procedure, and Annex C to the apparatus that you are able to use for these testing. So for the order, which one you should start first? If it's an ongoing clean room, which you are doing the test in a routine conditions, better to start with air velocity and flow measurements with air change per hour calculation. Then the differential pressure after making a balance in your clean room and make sure that you are getting enough air to provide a certain air velocity or the certain air flow rates, then you can move into the differential pressure. For differential pressure, if it's a cascade design, you'll be starting from the center, the highest pressure location, all the way to the out. And installed filter leakage test will move after differential pressure adjustment because once you adjust your differential pressure, this pressure changes also uh, stimulates the filters. If there is any potential leakage, then after these adjustments, you will be able to see them. And containment leak test, if you are providing this test, is better provided after filter leakage testing. 
and air visualization and recovery will follow. And the final test will be particle count testing. But if it's a brand new facility, and if you will be starting from scratch with a new facility, I recommend you to start with particle count and finish with particle count testing. Reason here, if your area is not clean enough, a certain level of cleanliness is not achieved, then you will be failing with most of the other tests because of the containment uh, maintaining in your cleaner. So make sure that you have a proper cleaning, make sure you are providing the certain particle counts uh, for the clean room, then you can move to the air velocity and flow testing. Rest of the test, you can prepare your list, but keep in mind, if one test and the adjustment after this test is affecting another one, make sure you are testing the first uh, free test and then the other one. So if anything changes, for example, if you move the differential pressure at the end, maybe a filter leakage test may fail after adjusting the pressure inside your clean room because you will be sending the high pressure into HEPA filters in order to maintain the higher differential pressure. So this will ignite a new leakage on your filter surface, which you didn't find from the first attempt. That's why adjust them and make sure they're not affecting the next, uh, the previous test is not affecting the next one. Clean room performance qualification test example. Let's start with an example of our clean room. I have a small clean room design with a sterile production area. That's just not in the real world, just, just an example to provide you a certain information. I have personal layer lock number one and two, which is opening to the anteroom. And I have material layer lock number one and two, again opening into anteroom. And I have sterile air lock, which moves into the sterile production area. From my sterile production area, I have wild capping room as well as autoclave room, which I'm dividing it into the definition of uh, room area. So each room area will be defined as X square meter of room. And then divide them to the sections, clean zones inside your cleaner. For example, if you take a look at this sterile production area, it was 34 meters square area. But when you have a divided room area, which is completely uh, isolated from the room itself, then this is another clean zone. So it will be classified as a different clean zone other than the room itself. So we make this division to the room itself and we'll be starting defining our clean room target classes. According to GMP Annex 1 and ISO 14644, I have these clean room definitions listed and colored on my map. So I put all these rooms into my list and also all the area into the definition. And then HEPA filter distribution, because I should know how many HEPA filters I have to be tested. And I should also know how many locations that I'm going to sample. And for example, in this anteroom, I have four HEPA filters. These HEPA filters are 610 by 1220 millimeters. And for personal layer lock, I have a smaller one in these small rooms, which is 305 by 305. So all these HEPA filters, either small size or the large size, are distributed in my clean room. So let's make a list of this area. I recommend you to start with these mapping because you will be putting all these clean room and clean zones into the list, room area, and then the volume, depending on the height of your clean room. My clean room height is 2.5 meter. So I have these calculations here. And my HEPA size uh, given here as a millimeter and the area, when you multiply this and convert it to meters uh, square meter, then 0 0.093, for example, for personal air lock number one for HEPA filter area. Reason we are calculating in uh, square meter is to provide air change per hour. So clean room air flow measurement, the yellow part here, we have to measure it. There are two options. If you are a turbulent environment, you can directly use uh, equipment like a bolometer to measure a direct volume flow as a cubic meter per hour. 
or if it's a unidirectional area, then you have to select a certain number of sample points. And these sample points, you will be measuring airflow. And your airflow should be 0 0.45 meter per second, plus minus 20%, according to ISO 14644-3. So when you provide this information, assume you measured all of them, you know your HEPA size, you know your airflow, when I multiply this to cubic meter per second, so in order to move it to second to hour, I multiplied it with 3,600, and now I have meter cube, cubic meter per hour flow rate. I know my volume for each clean room or clean zone, then to be able to calculate my air change per hour, I'm going to divide my flow rate to the volume, so meter cube, cubic meter per hour, uh, divide by per hour uh, meter cube it gives me a per hour calculation that's why air change per hour gives us a certain number without any uh, any integer here so important point assume you are providing a 10 cubic meter of air uh, the volume is 10 cubic meter and you are providing 15 uh, 500 uh, 150 meter cube Per hour, which means you will be able to change this air 15 times in every hour. So this is the air change per hour calculation table. When you move it into the uh, document, once you fill out this form with your airflow, the system will calculate you the air change per hour. So what was the expectation? Remember, we were talking about the different documents like IESD recommended practice 12.2 considerations in cleaner design. It comes with table four, gives us the airflow type, non-unidirectional and unidirectional airflow, and average velocity expectation, as well as air, air changes per hour. If it's a unidirectional, either class five or cleaner environment, we're not expecting them to be calculated with an air change per hour. If you take a look at my example, 600, uh, 648, air changes in each location is because the entire area is filled up with an HEPA filter with 0 0.45 meter per second air velocity. So instead of calculating these air change per hour, let's move back. We want to make sure that we're providing 0 0.45 meter per second plus minus 20%. But rest of the area, now we are considering, for example, ISO class 8, we have a wider range starting from 2 all the way to 20 or 20 all the way to 200 so we are making a comparison whether we are providing enough air to provide a better air change per hour calculation so this is a wider range as i say so you will be focusing on while you are thinking about differential pressure and cleanliness of your cleaner for example you can you can have four air change per hour in ISO class 8 clean room. But if you're not able to make a certain cleanliness level in this room, if you are keep failing with the clean room testing, I recommend you to increase your air change per hour. Or for example, if you're not using your clean room at night time, you can lower your air change per hour low as possible because it will save an energy. ISO has an energy saving uh, assumptions in the new standards from the ISO 14644 standard series as well. Differential pressure, as I said, if it's a cascade design, you will be starting from the inlet. Keep in mind, you are entering from this personal airlock to the anteroom and the sterile uh, airlock to the sterile production. From here, you are moving either auto room or wild capping. So our uh, center, our shelf for this is while either while capping or OTEC labor. So you will be starting adjusting or balancing these two. If it's the same class, you, have, you should at least maintain five Pascal, better to keep it in 10 Pascal. But if it's a different class, try to maintain minimum 15 Pascal differential pressure. And once you adjust this 10 Pascal between while capping to sterile room and auto layer to the sterile room, from inside to outside, you will be moving forward with the same way, all the way to the personal airlock number one to the outside CNC corridor. 
going down to a spark corridor. So let's move to the HEPA filter integrity testing. There are two methods described on the standard in ISO 14644-2 2019 version. One of them is aerosol photometer method, which is widely used in the industry. You require one aerosol photometer with aerosol generator and aerosol substance. So this aerosol generator generates the particles within a certain size. Remember, we had another webinar which we described how to uh, make HEPA filter testing. So we were describing the geometrical distribution of 1.7 within between a certain particle sizes. So this will be verified and you will be scanning the filter surface with a certain scan rate, which will be approximately five centimeter per second. And how to test with the aerosol photometer? First, you have to measure aerosol concentration on your upstream of your filters, which means how many aerosols you are injecting to the system in order to challenge your HEPA filter. Keep in mind, when you're using aerosol photometer, sometimes you are overcharged your HEPA filters, so make sure that you're providing uh, enough amount of uh, aerosols in order to obtain 100% reference as an upstream value, then record it. Make a 5 centimeter scanning, make sure you have overlapping strokes between your scanning profile, 1 centimeter is recommended, and probe distance will be 3 centimeter or less, but never touching to the surface of HEPA filter. And this should be performed over the entire downstream phase of each filter. Once you're done, you have to go back to the upstream challenge and verify that the starting value and the end value for the upstream is not very more than 15% plus minus. The next method described by the ISO 14644-3 is the particle counter method. So we have a particle counter here in this example with a smaller aerosol generator. An aerosol substance here could be an oil-based aerosols as well as a particles, reference particle materials, polystyrene latex particle materials. Especially for electronics, semiconductor and different industries, they cannot use an oil-based aerosols. In some pharmaceutical companies nowadays, they're also moving into the oil-based material to the polystyrene latex, which is safe for HEPA filters as well as air ducts. Because every time when you do the testing with an aerosol generators, you're providing a high amount of oil into your air duct. So this residue remains on your air filtration system. So if you're avoiding this residue to enter to your clean room in a long run because of the HVAC system failure or HEPA blowout, then they recommend you to use the different substance which can be scanned with the particle counters. So this example shows you uh, downstream with particle counter connected to the system. Upstream we are providing aerosol generator. Difference here is since the particle counters count any kind of particles, not like photometers, it's not a relative method. That's not a percentage of an upstream versus downstream. This is an exact count of upstream versus exact count of downstream. That's why we are using a dilution system. Sometimes when you take a look at aerosol generator for the particle counter, you are either seeing a few particles coming out of your aerosol generator, and I'm sure you will say, okay, on the other side, the photometer gives us a blowing out a huge dust from the aerosol generator versus a very small aerosol generator with a few particles either seen or not outside of this aerosol generator. Don't worry, because particle counters counts particles. So making this test uh, with a certain number of particles, this is an absolute measurement method. That's not a relative measurement method. That's why this aerosol is enough. Plus, in order to protect your particle counter, still you need to use dilution system as described on the standard. Dilution system takes all the particles from upstream. If it's, let's say, 1 to 100, it takes 99% from the filtration system and not introduce them into the particle counter. Just 1% goes directly particle counter. And the system, the control PC or the controller mechanism, multiplies the number of particles with 100. 
because it's a homogeneous system. So it gives you this reflection as a calculation. It's that uh, providing a very high count for the particle counters and it make uh, the uh, error which known as a coincidence error for the particle counter. So this big test with the particle counter, there are definitions with the standards. This can be used with all types of air handling systems. B says that's a part of ISO 14644-3, by the way, that's not my sentence. Uh, installations were outgusting of oil-based volatile aerosol deposited on filters and ducts cannot be tolerated or where the use of uh, solid aerosol is recommended. That's good practice for the particle counter method. Note to the entry for this standard. This method requires a series of calculations to set up the method and can also require the use of a diluter. The calculation can be manual through independent computerized systems or instruments like linked computers or with automated adapted light scattered airborne particle counter instrument, which is known as the Scanner Pro for the Lighthouse product family. Not to the entry, this method can be also used with oil-based aerosol where outgassing can be tolerated because particle counters technically count any particle, either oil-based or the latex-based, doesn't matter. So how to test? There are three things defined and makes you keep yourself aware of the risks. One, the concentration of aerosol challenge upstream of the filter should be sufficiently high to achieve capable practical scan rates. That's why in Scanner Pro we have these upstream challenge testing. If your aerosol challenge on your upstream is not enough, it gives you an alarm saying that insufficient challenge. Would you like to repeat upstream sample? So we try to avoid on this part. Second, in most cases, generated aerosol should be added to the upstream aerosol challenge to reach the necessary high challenge concentration. To verify such high concentrations, a dilution system can be reviewed, required to avoid exceeding the concentration to, to tolerance of the light scattered airborne particle counter, which is known as a coincidence error. That's why we are using um, aerosol diluters, dilution systems, with our equipment. The upstream aerosol concentration measurements taken immediately upstream of the filters should not vary more than plus minus 15% in the time from the average measured value, which means when you first start it, there should be a certain upstream value, and this upstream value will not vary more than 15%. That's why in uh, Scanner Pro, we have this concentration uniformity check and automatic system checking your uniformity. It takes this upstream sample with every five seconds and compare the value of each count. And if it's very more than 15%, the system tells you concentration is not uniform, repeat upstream sample. So it avoids you to have another unnecessary uh, error from the system. Particle counter method was not useful because we all know that there are a lot of calculations coming with these particle counter methods. However, the system we develop with the Scanner Pro comes with these significant leak scan rate units and mode selection. It gives you the MP value, the calculated MP value directly related to upstream challenge, your scan speed, and the aerosol limits. So this system uh, never requires you to make these calculations described on the standard itself. So you will be just scanning upstream and it will give you the MP value. Directly. So how to test? It's exactly the same test with the photometer method. You'll be measuring upstream challenge and then start scanning the filter surface with five centimeter per second, making slightly overlapping strokes, minimum one centim, and uh, approximately three centimeter from the downstream of the filter interface, and repeat upstream measurement between and after tests. So when we're talking about HEPA filter testing, one thing we should be well aware of is the way, the way we install the HEPA filters. For example, we have three different types of HEPA filter installation. 
one gel steel method. This gel steel, if the filter edge sitting into the filter frame in the downwards, it will be easy for you to check the leakages from these edges. But if it's a ball ceiling or if it's bottom to top installation, you will not be able to scan within between filters because the particle will be coming from the ceiling beam to the filter uh, gasket accumulated within between these two points. So what you can do is you can scan this area. From the first time, you'll be getting the particles which are accumulated within between filters, but you should expect it to be giving you the zero percentage if there is no leakage. But if you keep getting the leakages, this means there is a gasket leakage on top of your uh, filter. And if it's an above the ceiling installation, like the gel steel method, you will be able to see the gasket leaks within the corner. So the installation, knowing how you are installing your filters in your clean room, is the critical approach for a proper HEPA filter testing. Next one, how to scan with the HEPA filter as an example. So you will be starting from the surface of your filter, the perimeter of each filter, the seal between the filter frame, and the grid structure, including its joint, will be scanned. So you're scanning, after you scan the, around your HEPA filter, all the gasket and the gel and the structural material of your filter, then you will be have a quick face scan to verify overall integrity scanning, probe verification, and if you have a significant leak, you can be easily detect them. If everything is okay, you will be starting your scanning with the correct scan speed, uh, five centimeters per second. And once you're done, we're expecting you to have a slightly overlapping strokes. Here you can see the area between this red and the black. This is the overlapping stroke. And then when you find the leakage in any point, here in our example, the leakage is here, you will be stationary move your probe in this area and locate the position. In, in general, if you are moving downwards, first you find this location and the upwards when you are scanning in this, you can move your HEPA filter downwards with the HEPA, uh, when you move your scanning probe, keep it in downwards and find this axis as well and define one one, the cross section is your leakage. Don't put any mark into this point because maybe your customer or yourself will define this leakage and find it minor and maybe you want to repair it or maybe you will be touching the surface and create another leakage point or you may uh, block the leakage so the next time when you scan it to show this location it may not bleed through. That's why I never touch the surface of the HEPA filter even there is a protection cover. Always use the corners, the edge of filter to identify these locations, the leakage points. So the final test will be the particle count and classification. I have a uh, summary table here for you. Uh, my cleaning class is defined in ISO plus five. In GMP, it's a grade A. And my occupancy state is at rest conditions. And target particle size for ISO 0.5 and 1 micron, according to ISO 14644-1-2015 version. And 0.5 and 5 micron, according to GMP. And my particle sizes, both 3524.5 micron, while 832 for 1 micron and 20 particles for 5 micron according to GMP. And number of sample locations as per table A1, mode requires 6 locations. Even if you are using the previous version, the, the current version of GMP, it refers uh, to ISO 14644-1. It not refers to dash 1 2000, sorry, 99 version. That's why if any document refers to ISO standard without the year name on it, you will be moving into the final version. So since the GMP, the current version says 14644-1 should be followed for the calculations. Now we're following 2015 version. That's why you need a six locations to be sampled. Required single sample volume, even if we are using the same calculation, we ask 
20 multiply, uh, divided by the target particle size multiplied by 1000. So for ISO, we are dividing into 832 because the largest particle is one micron and the limit is here, 832. Multiply by 1000 gives us 24 liters. And GMP still 20 divided by 20 multiplied by 1000. Also, it says for grade A, I want you to collect one cubic meter of air every location. So room area was uh, 12 square meter. And my particle counter here is 100 liter per minute instrument. So in this case, minimum sample volume for ISO will be one minute because every minute I'm going to take 100 liters instead of 24 because I cannot take less than a minute. I cannot use this instrument for 16 seconds to collect 24 liters of air or 15 seconds to tw collect 25 liters for, uh, of air. I will be going with one minute sampling minimum requirement. And GMP requires 10 minute sampling because each minute I'm going to sample 100. So multiply by 10, I'll be able to collect 1000 liters. So here, before starting, according to the sampling procedure described in ISO, Annex A, Section 5, I'll be making zero count with my particle counter to see my particle counter has no background voltage, has no pulse count, and working properly. Then I'll be positioning the airflow with my azokinetic probe. If it's a turbulent, looking into the directly vertically upward situation, and ensure normal conditions for the selected occupancy state are established, which means if it's inoperational, my operators will inside. If it's at rest, even my testing person will not be inside during this testing. So validation person will enter the room, set it up, put the delay time, start the instrument. While this delay time, hold time, he will be out, room will be at rest, and the sample will start. And sample the volume of air determined as per single sample volume. And if any out of specification count is found at a location due to the identified abnormal occurrence, then that can be disregarded. But important here is identified abnormal occurrence. It is not just because we don't like the measurement. It's not just because we exceed the limit and we don't want to take this sample. There should be an identified abnormal. For example, you are in a rest condition, but somebody entered the room, so the room breaks the conditions, become an operational, your, so your limits are going high. So you can disregard this measurement. Or your instrument isokinetic probe fell down, so you get the high counts because of this movement, or somebody touched the probe itself during operational testing. So you can disregard it. But if out of specification count found an allocation attributed to the technical failure of the clean room or equipment, then the cause should be identified, remedial action taken, and retesting performed of the failed sampling location. Let's take a look at it. First, we will be starting for an ISO 0.5 micron. Now I'm taking sample. My customer says, please take one sample in each location. But as you can see, in location number two, I have a huge difference with 1140, and I have a note on my description. I said, at rest conditions have been deteriorated, someone entered the room, or isokinetic sampling probe fell down during measure. So there is an identified abnormal, so I disregard this measurement. I take the another one, I take the average, multiply this average with my particle counter uh, multiplier, and I found this number, and consider this as a limit, 3,520, since I have less than this number, all these location passes. Keep in mind here, now I'm multiplying it with 10, because I sampled 1,000. I'm making my list according to 1,000, one cubic meter of A. Since I sampled 100, I am multiplying it with 10 to reach to 1000 liters. So if you are using one CFM device, for example, your multiplier will be 35.3. Or if you are using 50 liter per minute instrument, you have to multiply it with 20 
in order to reach 1,000 particles, 1,000 liter, in order to compare it with the previous one. So the next one is ISO 1 micron. In this one, customer's SOP says, please take minimum two samples from each location. That's why I'm taking two samples. I'm taking average, I'm multiplying again with 10. And since all these locations are okay, except location number five, my report failed. Because one location fails, the entire clean room fails too. Let's move on to the GMP 0.5 micron. So all these calculations are based on this, and I should take minimum 1,000 liters, minimum one cubic meter of air. So whatever I count in each location is my average, also my consideration for one cubic meter of air. So what I'm doing is just take a look at these numbers and compare it with 3,520. So all location passes 4.5 what about 5 micron conditions? I'm still taking 1,000 liters. My average is equal. And my location concentration average is also equal. I have 20, 20 particles per meter cube limit. So I am in the limit. So I can tell you, filling line classified as grade A successfully according to GMP Annex 1. So for the test report, this is the final section. This test report shall include your name of your organization and address of it with the date and the referring standards that are using and their published year if necessary and physical location of the clean room or clean zone that you tested and the, if possible, uh, diagramic representation of your locations where you take all the samples of filter testing or differential pressure measurement. So make a diagramic uh, representation of each location and specify designated criteria for clean room or clean zone with the, its ISO class number and your limits, occupancy state, considered particle size, test method used, and the identification of the test instrument and their calibration certificates. And test results, including particle concentration data for all sample location, should be added. Same for other tests in clean room. You should be have the proof of your measurement along with your test report. The classification period and reclassification, according to GMP, every six months for grade A and B, every 12 months for C and D, according to the new 2020 draft. Still draft, still not published, but this is how it describes. When we move on to ISO 14644-1 2015 version, it says a trust or operational classification may, may be performed periodically based on risk assessment of the application, typically on an annual basis. And for the rest of the test, unfortunately, ISO 14644-2 says you will be making your risk assessment for the rest of the test for differential pressure, uh, filter leakages, uh, airflow measurements, containment leakage, airflow visualization. However, BSE and ISO 14644-2 come up with a national annex showing you the previous table which we used in dash 2 as a starting point. Reason here is, if it's a new clean room, how you would know there is a risk-based approach, how would you know your risk level because you didn't start yet. So, this table could be a very good reference to start from at a certain point. Then after, you'll be verifying your list level. These are all for today. And uh, we came to conclusion. Let me check the chat box and also the question pool. Here, if you have any question, you can type them in. We have six minutes more. I was a little bit slow today. Let me check this question part. Okay, I can see some of these questions. I see Connor's name. He says, greetings from Ireland. Thank you, Connor. Welcome. What is the particle counter sample size shall be collected during qualification for both at rest and in operation sets in class A, B, C, D? Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Mohammed Ismail was asking about the uh, particle counter sample size and the volume, which we described in the last section. 
one thing I should mention, if you say class A, B, C, D, that's not a relevant definition. If it's ISO, it's ISO class 1 to 9. If it's GMP, it's grade A to D. So using the right terminology is critical for defining limits. But I think we already answered this question, question during the session. Next one, as I suggest in the word validation in life science should only be used in relevant to the product or process. A more appropriate term, valid verification, exactly. In the life sciences, we're focusing on verification using calibrated instruments according to ISO standard or industry guideline, and this leads to qualification. So you qualify equipment and you qualify the HVAC system my expectation is that the final part of cleanup testing is cleanup certification to ISO part one, classification, part three, test methods, part four, design. Therefore, we qualify the HVAC system as a certified cleanup. Qualification is then leveraged as a part of validation in life sciences to meet regular, uh, regular to meet regulatory guidelines and product quality compliance. I hope that helps. Exactly. This is the sentence from the Connor Marik. He is also the convener of the ISO Technical Committee 209 Working Group 2, which is uh, newly formed. Uh, he is also the convener of EN 17141, uh, which we had one webinar together. Thank you, Connor. Using the verification term is the right thing. But in general, if we are using the cleanroom class, cleanroom validation, we should at least know we're talking about the HVAC system qualification. So the verification of the system, if, if you remember the table we prepared for the V scheme on the left side of our table is completely a verification line. And we put ourselves on top of it into DQ part, design qualification. So this is an HVAC system design qualification as well. Thanks for the uh, contribution. What is the recommended period for the tests, which we already covered in the last part of my presentation? Uh, there are recommendations for sure, but um, also you should go, if it's not a new uh, cleaner, you should go with your own data and make a risk assessment. For example, if you're taking every six months for particle count, but still failing in some location, you should even consider making it three months. Or if you're moving with the six months in ISO class eight, however, you are getting, let's say, five, six consequence passing results, you can consider moving it to the 12 months. This is how it works in general, but it's all about the data. But as a starting point, as I described here, for the starting point, I really find this useful table National Annex 1 from the BSEN. Uh, it's a good point to start with. So, next one is... For test report, can the name and address of the test organization be the same of the company itself? Yes, exactly. If you're not taking a third-party service, Test service as well as the authority could be the same, which means you can do your own testing. But documentation here has to be followed with the different uh, departments in your facility. But exactly, you can use the same naming if you are running these tests on your own. Unidirectional you know, airflow is recommended for ISO class 5 classifications according to uh, IEST cleaning concession 12.2 practices, but can there be an environment with turbulent air for ISO class 5 classification? So if you need a supply air for ISO class 5, which means around your device, you can have a turbulent air too. That's why the definition table, remember 12.2, there are two ISO class 5 definitions. One of them is a turbulent, non-unidirectional, another is a unidirectional. That's the reason why we have a supply A or supply ISO class 5 environment, which is turbulent, but supporting our internal environment to keep into the, uh, the surrounding barrier area clean possible in order to interfere with the internal part of our cleaning. 
Diluter 1 to 100 is a default diluter for particle counter. No, we have, for example, 1 to 500 as well. It will be defining, uh, it will be a different from uh, manufacturing to the manufacturer. But keep in mind, if you are using 1 to 100, you will be generating less particles with your aerosol generator. 1 to 500 will allow you to generate more particles in a centralized system, but it's not a it's not the uh, defined value 1 to 100. There are different types of uh, diluters as well. So one more question. For regular requalification, should we conduct at rest conditions or in operation condition as a worst case condition? I think if you are focusing on a worst case, it's always good to go with an operational condition because you will have the highest potential of contamination, which is your operators. We know there are two potential causes of failure in terms of contamination. One is your operator, the highest one, and another is the equipment. Equipment will be able to see in at rest as well because even if it is in at rest condition, all the equipment will be functional. They will be working. But when you do the testing in at rest in, oper in operational conditions, you will be seeing more and you will get more feedback from field in terms of challenge cont contamination concentration. So it's now it's one o'clock here. Uh, thank you very much for your time. There will be other questions for sure. I will be answering them and sending you an email. Thanks for your time today and hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you.